Hey there, it's Josh Forty, and welcome to episode one of The Golden Mike and episode 403 of the podcast. In this episode, to kick things off for The Golden Mike, I sit down with a not only a good friend of mine, a client of mine, and a mentor of mine, Brad Gibb. And I thought, what better way to kick it off than to start with kind of really the man that helped put this whole thing into action several years ago and uh, make The Golden Mike method possible. And to set up the conversation, I'm going to we're going to switch over to the interview here in just a second, but to kind of pre-frame Brad, Brad is somebody who I have trusted pretty much entirely with my financial strategy. Um, he's someone that has is ridiculously incredibly smart when it comes to the game of money and wealth. He has dedicated his entire life to studying it. He has five degrees. He worked on Wall Street. He took companies public. He has started multiple seven-figure companies, eight-figure companies, uh, just about done everything you can think of, uh, not only as an entrepreneur, but but specifically in that game of money and wealth. And so uh, this first episode here, we go for about an hour and a half. Uh, we talk about what happened to his prior companies. We talk about uh, what he's building now and solving the wealth problem for entrepreneurs. And we end with a brief conversation about crypto that kind of sets up a future interview that we'll be doing about Bitcoin and uh, you know all crypto in general. So without further ado, we're gonna cut over to that. So sit back and welcome to the Golden Mike and enjoy this interview with the man himself, Mr. Brad Gipp. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Golden Mike. My name is Josh Fority, and today we have a very special guest, someone who is not only one of my very, very good friends, but probably the smartest individual person that I have ever met. Uh, and we're talking about money, which I'm very, very excited for. And before, I, before we dive into the conversation, before I bring him on uh, or introduce him, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do as we begin this new path, this new journey of the Golden Mike. Um, you know, Think Different Theory was shut down due to a lawsuit with Apple, and then uh, now we're back with the Golden Mike, is to have important conversations, ask good questions, build relationships. But one of the things I think I want to do a little bit differently is I, I think in the last show that we did is I, I would bring on a wide variety of different people, which was great, but I learned so many different perspectives on so many different things that it was hard for me to perhaps dive deep into one specific topic through one lens. And so one of the things we're trying to do is bring on m certain people more consistently to dive deep. And my next guest is Mr. Brad Gibb, who is the person that I have personally chosen to follow for all things money, except for crypto, but we'll get into that. <laughs> um, but uh, for all things money and someone that I trust immensely, we've had him on the show many different times, but today we're going to talk about kind of what he's doing next, kind of the wealth conversation. Uh, for business owners specifically, we will talk a little bit of crypto, but I'm very excited for this to kind of dive one level deeper. So if you've never heard of Brad before, you are in for a massive treat. If you have, you know that you're in for a treat. And with that, Mr. Brad Gibb, thank you, dude, for coming well, on. Thanks for the setup, man. It's always, it's always fun. There's no better conversation with Josh. So ah, money, 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 dude. Money, success. I will say, before we dive into the money thing, though, dude, it's funny. I, I just had a kid. You know this. I'm a dad now. It's the best. It's the best, dude. Oh, my gosh. And Every person I asked, right, gave me some ridiculous advice about kids, except for you. Honestly, quite frankly, <laughs> you gave me the best advice, right? Mr. Six Kids over there. I was like, what do I got to expect? How hard is it? And you're like, that's not that hard. You'll figure it out. And I'm like, well, that's different, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, like, what's the hardest part? And you sat there and you're like, they're just there all the time. And like, that's been the most accurate that's been the hardest thing to figure out, right? Like that's been the most accurate uh, piece of advice. So thank you for that. Um, but I'm excited. Fill me in, dude. You've been up to a bunch of stuff. What have you been up to? A lot. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it's, uh, this parallels the, the, the kid conversation. It's been the best, worst six to 12 months um, <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that I've had. So yeah, I'm excited to dive into it. You and I have talked just a little bit about it. Where um, I, I feel like we're just at a, I think it kind of at that tipping point of like, see the vision, know that a change needs to be made. Then you navigate opening up the space for all of the change. Then we do all the testing and figuring out and that, that, and you know how I am. I've got to go elbows deep into whatever it is that we're yeah. doing now. It's like, okay, I have it all figured out. And the coolest part about this, Josh, people have said this and I, I didn't, I didn't, I always wondered, I guess, about this little part of it. You know, the whole Henry Ford thing. They're like, what would happen if you lost all your money? And they're like, I'd get it all back, you know, faster than I, than I did last time. That's definitely proven to be true. 
Mm. So to be able to rebuild a bunch with the network and the contacts, but the knowledge, the understanding, the just it's gone so much quicker. So that's kind of been a fun, uh, a fun side note. I think we're really ready to now. We got we got proof of concept. We got results. We've got all the pieces. Now it's just running the playbook, which is fun. Okay, so for for my own knowledge, because I want to hear it from your perspective, I, I have my version of what mm-hmm. happened. And I, I mean, you know, we were just at Inner Circle. Actually, I just saw you there at Inner Circle not so long ago, right? And uh, I talked to so many people that know you, and everybody has their own version of who Brad is, which is so funny to me because I'm like, <laughs> LOL, whenever I hear him talk about it, right? Um, but, like, for my own sake, like, give, give, me, a, give me a 60 second to three minute background. Like, start. I mean, yes, you're smart. You went to college, five degrees, blah, blah, blah. Wall Street, yes, entrepreneurship. But, like, pick up from where you were with Cashflow Tactics, right? I think that's where a lot of people probably know you from. You're yeah. in Cashflow Tactics. There was three of you. Pick us up from there, wherever you deem the best, and, and bring, bring us up to current. Up to current, yeah. So Cashflow Tactics definitely was, I would say, like the first commercial success, right? That's what got us some, some notoriety, some fame. So that's probably, yeah, where I'm the most well-known. And it was the most front-facing of anything that I had ever done. Um, so that's definitely, I think why people see me through that lens. But then if you came in and worked inside, you saw a different version of me as inside CFT than what was presented in marketing and, and podcasts and, and stuff like that. Um, and then if you knew me before cash flow tactics, where we'll go, wouldn't be a surprise. Cause I think it's a return back to, to what, or I guess maybe some permission to, to do what I had always sort of had in mind, but inside CFT the the hard realization about money and we fought this in cash flow tactics for 5 years the entire time of cash flow tactics this was a constant topic that we had to dive into um but everything out there including financial advice is a product to be consumed mm. and anytime you start with when you're going to create a product to be consumed you have to start with who is the consumer that you're building this for, right? Anytime you launch a business or launch any type of thing, the very first question you ask before anything else is who is going to receive this information? Who's the target audience? What, however you want to look at that. Um, and then everything cascades and flows from there. And so the constant uh, conversation inside of, of cash flow tactics was, well, who, obviously, who does this apply to? And we wanted it very, very badly to be able to apply to everybody. We feel like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Especially yeah. when you have like, we drove wealth, which I think is what makes us unique at Cashflow Tactics. And certainly me is I won't talk about something, try something, experiment on something until I've pushed all the way to like a first order set of principles. Yeah. And then, and then brought it back from there. And having done that in money, it's like, well, this, this should apply to everybody. Yeah. Right. Um, and while the principles do, you can't ever really actually apply yeah. principles. You have to then have strategies and tactics. And that's where we kept getting lost in it. So in, in the last 18 months, I guess 18 months ago, it really came back up big as to who does cash flow tactics apply uh, to. And, and we revisited that. And the realization in going down this, like when someone came into the cash flow tactics world, there were three of us at the helm of that. That was myself, Ryan Lee, and Jimmy Vreeland. And sort of whoever you ended up kind of aligning with is sort of who mm. you create a relationship once you were uh. more on the inside. And so for the last sense. five years, I sort of had my arms around all the business owners because Ryan and Jimmy were like, you need to go talk to Brad about that because you know the tax and entity element was obviously a huge part to it. But then dealing with the everything that comes on with the business owner. So for a long time, I just had my arms. I was like, if if I could get a business owner through the door, which was difficult because yeah. we didn't create the door for them. If they did and they could get inside, I essentially just had this little group inside with my arms around them saying, hey, I know, let me interpret everything for you. Yeah. Well, and I feel like that was a- is accurate too, because like cash flow tactics what is or was slash is front facing marketed now towards a nine to five, right? Uh, employee. Exclusively. Right. Exclusively. Right. And then you would get the, these people that meet you at a mastermind or people like me who find you and then like tell all their friends. Right. And they were like, go talk to Brad. And like a lot of those are business owners. Right. And so it was like, wait, but doesn't he do the like, cash flow tactics thing? It's like, but yeah, but like 
And so that actually makes a lot of sense with like, you've got these entrepreneurs that are in there, but they're not really in there, but they are, right? Yeah. Um, but the marketing was, you know, towards a different one. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Right. And, and we thought for a while we could just change kind of the front end marketing around it yeah. and then everything else would be fine. Right. And when we started doing that, we realized, well, no, you know, the, the, the front end product or, or intake or uptake into it had to be different. And then we're yeah. like, well, maybe just the first, like we kept thinking these two paths would meet up. Mm -hmm. And as we pulled on that thread, we actually realized it wasn't just the messaging or even the programs. We had to have different team members. We had to have different language. We have to have yeah. different delivery styles, everything, even though we were operating the same principles, what it came down to is the only way to serve both avatars was to have two separate companies. Okay. That's that makes what it sense. came down to. That makes sense. Okay. So here's the question I think everybody wants to know, and I'll let you decide how you want to answer it. Right. I mean, I have, I think I have, I have my unique perspective on, on things. I think everybody does have this, but like what happened, like there's been a change, right? So like, uh, Jimmy, Ryan, Brad are no longer three, three of the same company, right? So just structurally, if someone's listening right now and is like, okay, there's been changes made, what do they need to know? What, what do the entities now look like? And where does each person fall? Yeah, so cash flow tactics as it existed is just entirely on pause right now. It's just sitting and we're, we're not actually doing anything. So all the programs have been um, dismantled and stopped and we found a home for everybody that used to be a client inside of cash flow tactics and it's not doing anything other than just sitting there while we're working out the final details okay. of like you know who owns the list who's gonna you know own the ip where is right. that going to be taken and what's going to be done with all of that so it's it's not operating for okay. for all intents and purposes right now all the team members have been moved or repurposed and 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 the the other thing that was hard to see in cash flow tactics is it, it was the tip of the spear, but then we had businesses behind yep. that further delivered. And so we're continuing to do all that stuff almost un uninterrupted, uh, just now trying to figure out again, like how are we going to go to the marketplace with the messaging and, and, the, and the coaching consulting part of it? Um, the determination was for a while in the beginning, while we were all learning stuff, the three of us together were better uh, than the individual yep. parts. Um, and so when we, when we put us together, we could do more than when we were apart, but over time, um, as we all got better at what we were doing, as the communities got bigger, as we got more expertise in, in what we were doing, and we just had the freedom to choose a little bit more about what we wanted to spend our time doing. Mm. We, I kind of proposed it to the guys that eventually I was like, look, um, we're in a compromise and. I believe a fundamental truth around compromises. Compromises are always a losing proposition and everybody involved in them end, ends up losing. Mm -hmm. And we were compromising in that like our highest level program was a combination of the best of Ryan, Jimmy and Brad. And for a while it was really good. But what was lost in that was some people were there to only get me. Mm -hmm. And so they were paying for the program, but I only had space in that mastermind to do one third uh, of what I was capable of doing. So they were yeah. paying full price to get one third of me. Same goes for Jimmy. They wanted the stuff, you know, Jimmy's specific stuff that he could bring to the marketplace, but they were only getting a third of that or, you know, and it was getting mixed up in the message and everything else. And then same with Ryan. So the, the and this was like a mind blowing part because it had just always been that we were, three of us would be better than one of us. Yeah. To where it ended up coming down to the three of us was worse than just one of us in, independently. Um, and so as we talked about what does everybody want to do for the next five, 10, 15 years, what do we want to focus? Where do we want to have the biggest impact? It really came down to, we all had three very different focuses, mm. same set of underlying principles, but a different avatar, a different application, a different, yeah. a different part in that journey. And none of us wanted to, to, to give that up or change that. And so we were just stuck in that compromise. Got it, got it. So as of now, then, as far as cash flow tactics concerned, because there's no actual company running, you don't, you are not business partners with Jimmy. You are not business partners with Ryan in the context of cash flow tactics. In the content of front end marketing, coaching, consulting, no, we've all kind of packed up and gone our, our three separate ways and all, yeah, running our own focus nice. there. Yeah. Do you have, I, cause I know you had, um, 
I know you had back end company with Ryan specifically, right? Um, mm -hmm. Does that still exist? Is that still a uh, functioning and operating? Yeah, it does. We, we had brought that business and Jimmy had brought his business. And I think one of the best things we decided to do was not to put everything mm. in the pot yeah. and recognize, you know, there were skills and, and things Jimmy was doing on the real estate side that I wasn't involved in enough to warrant yeah. Uh, partnership on it. And so he kept all that separate. We kept ours separate. So then unwinding, it actually became pretty quick and simple. Um, so yeah, on the back end of our businesses, those are going to continue to be back end service focused businesses. And we're still partnered on those and, and we're still running those. They're obviously not as amazing and awesome as we want them to be because they don't have lead sources that, that used to come from CFT, right? So we're, we're kind of picking up some of those pieces. Um, okay. Yeah, that'll for for everything we can see for the future uh we'll continue with those because the the benefit of being with a business partner there without that like it's oh that, i'm just kind of realizing this right now like on the cft side all of us wanted to be attractive characters we all mm. wanted to 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 have the messaging or marketing yeah. or attraction of a, of a certain person the other businesses we run are much more I wouldn't say entirely, but they're much more transactional. They're much more, they are just, we have a product, you want it, we already know, let me put it in place. And so yeah. that can serve a much broader. So neither of us are the attractive character on that. And so then our abilities and everything still line up really well. And there's no reason to not stay in partnership there. That so that's sense. all staying in place. And that's just you and Ryan, right? Just me and Ryan. Yeah. Okay. I have so many questions that I would love to ask you about in there, but I really do want to focus on sovereign entrepreneur and and I think that uh, I think that sets the tone really well for for anyone that does follow you and know you um, on that. So kind of shift. Well, is there are, are you good? Is that good there? Like as yeah, far as I yeah. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. So shifting gears to what you're working on now, um, which I'm very excited about, and. I kind of, before we go into the specific details of it, I, I would kind of like some story um, and kind of how this came about. And I remember you came over to my house one time and we were, we were chatting and I asked you, you know, like if you got to the end of your life, like you want, you want recognition? Do you want fame? Do you want less? And you're like, nah, I, I, you know, and you told me what, if you got to the end of your life, you could only work on, you know, this one thing that would make you, you know, fulfilled. And I was like, interesting. I feel like that's kind of where we're going with this. But, um, you are, you've shifted gears and you are, you, you mentioned you're kind of going back to the original vision of you, which is working with entrepreneurs, right? Yep. So, so I'm an entrepreneur. I, I know Brad and I've heard of Brad or I'm, you know, I'm finding Brad for the first time, or I, maybe I've known Cashflow Tactics. Entrepreneurs are going with you because you're the entrepreneur here. And what's next? Where are you going? What are you building? And you mentioned, um, you mentioned that you build it, if you know, someone lost everything, they'd build it much back, uh, back much faster. And that's how that seems to be true uh, for you so far. Help me understand where is Brad now and what are you building now? And what does the future look like as far as, cause like taking your principles and applying them to the world? Okay, couple of things. I do wanna just touch on that question you asked me. Cause dude, I, I think I've told you this, but in case I haven't, I'll say it here in front of all listening ears. Like, <laughs> That question was what really didn't stir this, but it definitely made it to where I couldn't, because I still wasn't even 100% decided. It's a tough thing to turn your back on five years of business partnership and friendship, everything that I'd built. I mean, I was essentially going to start completely over because I had to, not just business partnership wise, not just income and revenue wise, but also reputation wise and, yeah. and existing asset wise and all of that kind of stuff. And it was, it was uncomfortable to, to, to <laughs> yeah, I can leads, imagine. right? Yeah. But when you ask me that, like, what do you, what is the greatest problem you could put your mind to solving? My answer was wealth for the entrepreneur. Yeah. I, it's the, it's the biggest problem. I really believe I'm very uniquely positioned to solve it. And like you say, if I just solved it and it was documented and proven and then nobody knew about it, like nobody knew about me, I'd be totally fine with that. If yeah. it was to where someone else could take it and grow it, I want to build this until that is like undeniably solved. And, and I want to pause that right there for a second because it's something that I find very interesting. You said you think that you're uniquely qualified to solve it. I agree with that very much so, right? I, because of how much I know you and, and how much I've talked to you and pushed you. And, and I mean, like you've thought through things so many, but I think one of the interesting, or so many different ways, right? But I think one of the interesting things about that is 
I used to think that, how do I say this? I used to think that pretty much anybody could do anything, if that makes sense, like broadly speaking, right? It's mm -hmm. like anybody could be a good podcaster. Anybody could be a good business person. Anybody could go be an entrepreneur. Anybody could go whatever, right? Do, be a doctor or whatever. And the more I've grown and the more I think that I have like seen how humans operate, I think that like, while any individual person may have the physical or mental capacity and actual, like they could physically move and do the things that were required to be a particular person or thing, right? Not everybody can do everything. And there are some people that just have, whether that be their background, their experience in life, their life choices, their, their unique you know, ability, their ability to forego praise or recognition, right? Whatever those things are, I feel like uh, some people are just called and I'll never forget when I was in, you know, your living room and I was asking you about the question for the future of my business, right? And I was telling you my plan and you're like, you know, if you were anybody else, Josh, I'd say, don't do that, <laughs> right? Like, don't do that. But then you're like, but you're you and you've proven yourself in that, in this category right here, right? That enough to where I would say, if you want to take that bet, take that bet, right? And, it, you know, is in that, in that very unique uh, setting. And so when you say, that you are uniquely qualified to, uh, you believe that you're uniquely qualified to solve this, this problem of, entre or of wealth for entrepreneurs. Um, not only do I agree with that, but I'm curious in, and I, and I do, I want you to keep this like 60 seconds or less. Why do you think that that is? So or why do you the, know it is, I should say? The, yeah, yeah, the, the concept of calling is an interesting thing. You're right, it's not just, can somebody do this, but then it's, should somebody do this? And will they, if if you don't enjoy it at a deep enough level, you're not called to to doing it, right? And if you don't have certain experiences or connections or contacts or or people or like I say experiences put in your path, then you're not called to it. Like anybody could go and learn all of the same things and gather the same number of facts, but experience and then just the joy that it brings you to me are the other two pieces that would make up what a what a call uh, would would really be. And so my training and then my unique experience inside the entrepreneurial world. And then again, just even through the five years where we were serving primarily W2, I spent every spare moment I had, which wasn't more moments than I, than I probably should have been spending, then re-engineering and figuring this out and thinking about the business owner dilemma. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think it's, I think it's the intersection of those, those three things. And I would go back to your thing. Like, can I be a good enough podcaster? Absolutely. But will I ever be, you know, Joe Rogan? No, there's other things right. that Joe would do or other people would do that would take it to a further level that makes it, you know, a, a calling as opposed to just a skill set that somebody yeah. has. Yeah. And I, I, my answer to that would be, if I, if I can share, um, would be, I remember you looked at me and you made a very bold statement, a very bold statement. I think there's very few people that could back up this, at least that I know that could back up the statement, which was, I think I could have the level of conversation that uh, Jordan Peterson has about what he does and that Alex Ramosi has about what he does or that Russell Brunson has about what he does. I think I can have that level of conversation or better about the money space, right? And about how money works and, and entrepreneurship or whatnot. And for me, the unique perspective of number one, not only have you taken the mainstream approach to money, which is like you understand from a knowledge perspective, having five degrees and working on Wall Street, right? Also then being an entrepreneur, taking companies public, and then being an entrepreneur for yourself, working with entrepreneurs, working with the nine to five, in, in, in conjunction with how your brain works, which is just, it's so factual, it's so logical, and it's so like data driven, like principle driven, right? I think the unique intersection of those three things, or of, the, of those things is, makes you uniquely qualified because most people in the money space aren't entrepreneurs, right? And most people in the entrepreneur space that, that they go learn about money, they're like, they want to go be an entrepreneur. And like entrepreneurs and money, like we think that they're the same thing, but they're like very not, right? Like wealth and money, like wealth is boring and entrepreneurship is not, right? It's like, yep, you, you see what I'm saying? And so I think that your brain and your ability to say that I'm going to be an entrepreneur because I love entrepreneurship, yes, and because it's who I am as a producer, right? A necessary evil, if you will, right? But like what I want to figure out is the money side of things, but also I understand the entrepreneur because I'm called to this here. I don't think most people have the patience or have the discipline or have the just the simple dedication to think through problems all the way 
sacrificing profit and sacrificing growth of the business in, in the short term to go and do that. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I know that sounds really, really bold to say those types of things, but the reason I believe it is I don't know anyone else that has pushed as deeply into first principles around wealth as I have. And like yeah. you said, wealth is different than business. And yeah. there are people that have pushed into first order conversations of business like Ray Dalio. That's just, I just want to know principles of, of, of business and how this or works, investing, right? Yeah. Or marketing like Russell Brunson and Alex Hormozzi would, or just the human experience like Jordan Peterson did. And that's how you clean house with somebody in an argument or a conversation that way is if somebody's stuck on tactics and they've memorized and they know exactly how all the tactics works, but they've never pushed into the first order principle driving it, then, then the conversation's over. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. And, and it's, I, I, it, you're, yeah, you hit on a couple of things that are, that are important. I was studying wealth before I really studied business and for a long time. And they're, and they're separate concepts, which a lot of people don't understand. And I was studying them without having any money. So I wasn't being like, what should I do with my money and my circumstance yeah. based on the way the world is today? I wanted to know how does money work and operate regardless of whether I have any or not, whether whatever's going on economically or whatever time frame it might operate in. And, and I figured all of that out and then stacked experience and execution on top of it, which so many people don't yep. go that direction and they don't understand there's a difference between principles of wealth and, and the business element of it. And they look at wealth, things like real estate, and they can't parse out the asset from the business activity around yeah. a real estate business. Now I'm going to say something. I've been saving this for a second. Um, I think the reason why my, like what completes my calling is I put wealth in its proper place. Mm. Most people think wealth is what you then achieve. Like you, you go through layers of, of education and business and then into wealth and wealth is at the top of it. To me, it's the other way around. Wealth is subservient and positions better the entrepreneur to do what the entrepreneur is here to do. So it has to serve entrepreneurship. So to me, entrepreneurship is a higher level than wealth, mm. which is why somebody that really succeeds at entrepreneurship tries to come back to wealth and they're bored. And yeah. they're, it seems simple. I, I think that's a big part. And I don't know anyone else that truly puts it in its proper place and shows it's it's necessary, but it's, it's, it, it's a component. Okay. Does that make when, sense? Yeah. Yeah. When you say wealth in its proper place, are you talking about wealth in its proper place for entrepreneurs specifically? Uh, for entrepreneurs specifically. Okay. And the same principle applies, I think tweaked, maybe less emphasized for a W2 person, but this is, this was one of the hard things to understand in CFT is we were giving people specific advice inside of CFT, like come in, this is the path this is what you need to go. And then an entrepreneur would come in and they'd be like, that doesn't fit. That doesn't yeah. feel right. I like yeah. the principle, but I don't, that doesn't feel like the right action. Yep. And the reason why is because a business owner had a business, but a W2 person didn't. Yeah. And with the absence of a business, we had to bring in some entrepreneurship to that W2 person in yep. order to get them on the path of wealth where that does, that's not necessary on on the, the business owner side, and that can be left out. Yep. Thus, the application becomes different. Yeah. So what are you building? Like, I want you to get 30,000. You got Sovereign Entrepreneurs. I know, I know that's the name of the company, right? Yep. So Sovereign Entrepreneurs is what you're building. But I'm asking this for me for a second, not, not for anybody that might potentially be listening. Like, I want you to answer this as if I'm asking, what, what are you building at Sovereign Entrepreneurs? Like, I know you want to figure out the wealth principles and like, things like that, but like, what, what does this next chapter look like? The next, I don't know, year, three, five, 10 years, whatever. What are you building? What I'm building is still encapsulated in the concept I want to solve the wealth problem for entrepreneur. That includes the principles and the concepts. But if I just, like, I don't want to do the rich dad, poor dad thing of like, write this book, shift everybody's mindset, and then nobody has any idea what to do with it, right? Okay. He never really got into the application of it. So it's, it's the first principles that wealth is built on the strategy that an entrepreneur should follow to be able to get there. And then the tactical roadmap to follow so that they can actually achieve the result and be changed by it. 
So okay, but but it's all of those. Yes, yeah, but go go broader for a okay. second. Go thirty. Go go big idea with me for a second, because I I want to know. Like, don't teach me. Like, like paint me a vision, <laughs> right? Paint me a vision. Come like on. like like think back. You expect me, Josh. Huh? I can't not teach you. Okay, but like you know what I'm saying though. Like I'm, we're at dinner right now, right? And we're yeah. sitting there, and I'm like, like if I were to sit down with you, and I would have asked you, like, what's the vision for Think Different Theory, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or even like, what's the what's the vision for Golden Mike, right? To me. Uh, the, the, the big idea fuels a brand. It, it fuels a vision, right? That the future-based cause is an idea. And then I always draw like a circle on a whiteboard, right? And I'm like, this is your idea. This is the vision. And then I draw like the two lines, like kind of down like this, right? So it's like if a boat was going through the water, it's like, you know, you got the thing. So you, you push this idea forward and it kind of creates this current. And then like the offer or the systems or whatever, the structural pieces like fall underneath it, right? Yep. And it's like, you don't, your offer or your business, it doesn't solve every single problem or doesn't solve every single thing of this big idea, but it solves a piece of it, right? That kind of that yeah. core piece, right? And so like for me, like with Golden Mike, uh, it, it is a, a, a modified version of where we're at with Think Different Theory. But like when I look into the future with it, like my idea is I want to be someone where like, like I want to be the room and the platform where important conversations happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, because I believe that questions and relationships, right, those two things, questions and relationships are the thing that ultimately will drive success in every area of life. I think it will make every single person better. And so for me, like the thing that has opened up more doors and opened up more opportunities than anything else is a microphone through the concept of relationships. And the thing that allowed those relationships to form, the thing that ultimately brought people to the show was I asked really, really good questions. And so my, my vision here is to create this place where important conversations can happen, where, you know, the, the who's who's like, hey, I'm going to go announce it on that show. Or I want to be asked questions by Josh's show because I know he's going to bring out a unique perspective that, that, you know, nobody else can bring out, right? And that, I think that benefits me because I want to learn. It benefits them. It benefits listeners. It benefits everybody, right? So like big picture vision, right, is I want to create influence with successful people, wealthy clientele, people like that. And I could care less, not, I don't want to care less. I, I do care fewer or littler less not not you know what i'm saying like i care less about the overall size of listeners that i have and much more about who i'm having conversations with right and so big picture vision like i want to create this place where those conversations happen and then underneath i want to have a an offer and for right now it'll be service based but you know services and you know education around things that can make those people's lives better Right. So that when someone comes on, it's not just me asking questions. It's not just me, you know, giving them a platform. But now to maintain the relationship, like I want to actually have a service, something that I can offer them that will solve a problem for them, make their lives better so we can stay in touch and build that network. Does that make sense? Yes. So like big vision for you, sovereign entrepreneur. What does it look like? Like, what are you building? Um, glad you're making me have this conversation because like I have all the math figured out. Right. Yeah. And I go I, I go I go bottom up. But Josh, you're the. The, the, the vision and then, and then we'll figure it out bottom down. So this will actually help me articulate some of it. Um, so what I, in solving the wealth conversation for the entrepreneur, the real outcome that I want to see in the pool of entrepreneurship is I want to de-risk the entrepreneur. Okay. You can't de-risk entrepreneurship, right? There's always so much outside of our control yeah. that we are always at risk. We're always an exposed nerve. There's something, there are elements of, of that, that we just step into as an entrepreneur, that it just is the way that it is. Yeah. And as, if you think about like one of the symbols I like is the, is the yin and yang of, of yeah. chaos and order. And as entrepreneurs, we have to learn and we push into the world of chaos. That's mm -hmm. where our opportunity lies. Yeah. That's where our impact lies is stepping into some amount of chaos. But if we push too far or stay there, at some point, we cannot take on any more chaos. And when we, as an entrepreneur, when we hit that place, we get frustrated and we think, well, if I just did a little bit more, right? Or if I just, what got me here was taking on chaos. So let me take on even more chaos. And then what usually happens is instead you overdo it and everything burns to the ground. And in that, you then create opportunity to just stay in chaos and you rebuild and you're in build and burn because you're, you're totally enveloped by chaos. The real answer to solving that is instead of pressing into more chaos, it's creating the balance of order or certainty. And that's the role of wealth for the entrepreneur. Wealth is not chaotic. It's not entrepreneurial. It's not 
risk taking the way we would think about it. It's the opposite of all of those things. And if we bring the entrepreneur into order and for the first time, give them a stable place to stand, it then gives them the ability to actually push into more chaos and reach a, a subsequent additional level mm. inside of the, the, the game of entrepreneurship. So we're the yin to the yang of entrepreneurship, that chaos, we're the order to that, which by combining them, then we get to go to higher and, and bigger levels. And the application of that is me. Like, Josh, if, if you shut you and you did this to an extent, I haven't taken business profits from my business in about 18 months. How many of you could not take profits from your business for 18 months because you saw an opportunity that you knew you needed to go after and transform to reach another level? Almost no one yeah. can do that. Yeah. But that's the, 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 the certainty that I can stand on, a platform that I can stand on to then figure out what I'm going to take on next. And the platform I stood on is wealth. That's its role. And mm. everything we're going to build underneath that is built around that concept. It's not about making more money. It's not having more money in your bank account, although all those things will happen. It's about doubling down on the wealth creation possibilities of yeah. entrepreneurship by creating certainty. So would you say that it would be an accurate statement if I were to put into words like a big idea, Russell might call it a future-based cause, right? Is you're trying to create the place where entrepreneurs come to become wealthy. Is that the correct wording or no? Yeah, that's, that's the way I would say. You're rich right now as an entrepreneur, but there's a difference between rich and wealthy. Mm. And what's the, the difference between those two things? Time frame and activity, or, you know, knowledge, time expertise, okay. time, time in order to get it, right? Time frame meaning what? I can be rich now, but not tomorrow. But if I'm wealthy, I can, I can sustain my, my life indefinitely. Okay. So wealth is, I don't know, forever, but wealth is ongoing. Right. It's the long term portion of rich, I guess, if you extend it out. So, hypothetically, then, like if I were to say, in, you know, this isn't a principle based terms, but like you would think of like wealth has assets that pay your lifestyle, right? Uh -huh. And then rich is I have a lot of money. Yep. Now, hypothetically, though, could if I made so much money, like so much money, right? Like if I had. I don't know, a billion dollars in liquid cash or something like that to where like technically I'm rich, but like, could I make enough to where I'm so rich that it would be beyond reasonable assumption to where I would ever run out? Would that be considered wealth still or no? It, it, it would be, and you would actually stop being rich. Like let's say you sold your business for a billion dollars. Mm. At that point, even if it just went into cash, you're stopped being rich because you don't have income coming in from the activities of your business. You don't own that anymore, but cash is an asset and it has, I'll loosely use the word asset, but yeah. cash can produce enough wealth if you have enough of it to where, yeah, the wealth then independent of your income creation possibility, you're wealthy. Yep. Got it. It would take significantly more than it would take in other assets, but it can be done and it's done that way all the time. And the key there though is, you had to figure out a principle of wealth in order to keep yeah. the money that the business created. Mm. Like lots of people had really big businesses and then were not able to execute and then keep and hold on to that. And so the day that you make that switch, you might have a billion in your bank account, but do you know the principles and have the skill sets and the network around you to where 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, there's still enough there that you still remain wealthy and you don't have to go back to income. Okay, so income equals rich. If I rely on income, I'm rich, no matter how much I make. But when I can stop relying on income and what in any capacity I'm set for life, whether that's an asset or whether I just have a billion dollars in cash, right? Which once again, loosely asset, not technically, but right? That would make me, that would mean wealthy. So wealth is I own my time, rich is I'm tied to income. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And I would just say, yeah, rich is tied to income, wealth is tied to assets. That's fair. Okay. Okay. So sovereign entrepreneurs is 
step one for entrepreneurs? Like if I'm an entrepreneur right now, like let's go back to the conversation of you've left Cashflow Tactics, you started the sovereign entrepreneur thing, you've got this business come off the ground now. When do I come to you? What do you do? What does that look like? When, what are you building? And principally, what, do, what am I doing first? Why that? Yeah. I mean, to where this has to go is it has to apply to somebody who even is just entrepreneurial minded, right? Because, dude, and we, we've talked about just school and education and the state of the world, all those kinds of things. But like, by not being supported as an entrepreneur early, I took an entirely different path. Now, my path is great. It got me here. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but I had to work really hard against what I was trained to get back to the entrepreneur side. So eventually, it, for this to be complete, there has to be a way to utilize this no matter where you are in the journey. And the reason I say that is I want- Hold on, I hold, on stay, hold on one second. What do you mean by, what do you mean like you had to work really hard to get back to, get, get, give us some context on that. I had to relearn what success around becoming an entrepreneur was. I had to go against what I believe that, well, a good job, right? At a prestigious firm is what I should be pursuing in order to have what I want in life. As an entrepreneur? Oh, 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 as, oh, in order to get what you want I, in life. Before okay. I was an entrepreneur, in order to leave to become an entrepreneur, right? I had to redefine what risk was. I had to redefine that like once, once you're out of college, you never invest in yourself ever again as a W-2. And okay. instead I had to learn to write bigger checks to myself to invest in, into, into, you know, my 401k account or, you know, those types of things. I had to relearn what actions to take to better become an entrepreneur. Okay. So maybe that's a better place to start to, to answer the question with it is why, why are you an entrepreneur? Because like <laughs> you didn't have to be, and like mm -hmm. with your knowledge of money, you could have still ended up outrageously wealthy, right? Not being an entrepreneur. Yes. Right. Yeah. I had already solved my wealth problem before I became an entrepreneur. Okay. And now I wanted to be rich. So I wasn't, you know, that's what drove me into entrepreneurship was I wanted to be rich. I had already figured out wealthy and I, it was already lock, stock and barrel game over before I ever made $60,000 a year. Which most people can't even comprehend, but we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But like, but like for me, I know why I'm an entrepreneur, right? Like I, for a while, you know, I was, I, I, you know, I'm entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you know, I get into entrepreneurship yeah. and I'm, you know, little Josh. And then I'm like, everybody claims to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is this, you know, sexy hype board. I'm not an entrepreneur anymore. Right. Like I'm like, I'm, I'm going to explore what that's not like. Right. And then yeah. like, I tried that for like six months. I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, screw that. I am an entrepreneur. Right. Like, and like, I know now, I think for me, like, because I went through that, you know, that journey of like, I am an entrepreneur, I'm not a business owner right? Like there's, they're different, right? Like I am an entrepreneur. Like that's who I am like through and through in, in the world of my career. Why are you an entrepreneur? Man, that's a really good, I don't know if I've ever been asked it that way. And you're right. It's tempting to say, well, oh, cause I want to work for myself and be independent. Yes. And no, I can make just as many arguments that you're less free and less independent, yeah, right? Definitely. As, as an entrepreneur, for me, it comes down to you know, as, as I looked at my path to get here, it was like, yeah, you're probably too young for this. Do you know the game Plinko in, uh, in Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, that, some listeners will get that. But you drop this little chip and it was all these little pins and it would find its way down and you'd bet on where it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Your yeah. chip like yeah. falls down. But almost in reverse, as I was trying to get up, I'd run into barriers and have to move one, one way or the other. And I was perfectly content and happy as long as the opportunity in front of me matched the vision that I had. So there were times like two, three year stints where I was either in business partnerships or even in employee relationships or, or, you know, pseudo partnership type independent things where as long as the vision around me was bigger than, than the opportunity, I was fine. Cause I could continue to grow and, and pursue and push through that. But it wasn't until the vision stopped expanding and then mine eclipsed it that I had to leave to pursue the vision that I could see. Mm. So once I had more vision than those I was working for or those I was in partnership with or those that I was around, yeah, but, then I was trapped. Yeah, but I would push back on that. I think there's deeper than that because like, okay, what if you got around, I mean, like if Elon came to you, I guarantee he's got a bigger vision than you do, right? If yeah. Elon came to you and was like, yo, come work for me and you know, da 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 and vision, like, would you accept? And I, I tell myself that, yeah, if someone can cast a bigger vision, 
than I can. You'd go work for him? I think so. You'd go work for Elon? Okay, maybe I'm wrong then. I, I mean, bro, there's not I, a single person. Know. There's not a single person in the world. Brunson tried to get me yeah. to come to ClickFunnels for right. a bit, a minute. And I'm like, there's no, he's like, what would it take? I'm like, bro, like if you gave me a million dollars in cash, maybe I'd sign a year contract or something, maybe. But like, I can't. Like, here's why I'm an entrepreneur. Right? I'm an entrepreneur because at, at, at fundamental principle level, I take responsibility for my life in every, in every act, every area. Yeah. Right. And because money is such a massive driver for me, number one, I take full responsibility. I'm in full control. No one tells me what to do. Uh, number two, well, I take full responsibility. I'm in control. Number two, no one can tell me what to do. And number three, I want to build the things that I find meaningful and valuable and design my life around my business, right? For me, yeah. a biz, like I, the reason I'm an entrepreneur, not a business owner, is because a business owner thinks about the business first. I don't think about the business first, right? Like I think yeah, about the idea yeah. first. I think about me first, like not me, but like the, the idea and like my lifestyle and the, my calling and like the, into yeah. it. Like I, that's why I'm an entrepreneur, like through and through. Yeah. Like I can never work for somebody else because I cannot have, I cannot let somebody else tell me what I can and cannot do ever. Not even once. Right. Like it yeah. drives me insane because of the second I disagree with something, I will walk. And it's like unhealthy to an extent, but like, yeah, that's why I'm an entrepreneur because I take radical responsibility for every a aspect and area of my life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I just wonder if, if other people could see that same opportunity inside of somebody else's bigger opportunity. Now, I, I don't care about Elon's vision, so I would never go work for him because right. I couldn't get passionate about the vision that he had. I understand. If, if someone came to me to, to make this vision bigger than I could ever possibly make it, then why wouldn't I gain access to those resources and, and create maybe I'll be, a, maybe a I'll get there. relationship? Maybe I'll get way. there. I guess that's the way that I think about it. And I think that you could form, you know, cause I, I've talked to plenty of people that are amazing entrepreneurs yeah. That, yeah, but that, that end up feeling the same way, but I think it's a little just different. And then there's some things in just how you're wired and, and, and what you crave and what you, like, I wish you, I could be a number two, dude. That'd be so dope. Yeah. Like if I could be a number two, but I'm like, if shit goes wrong, like it, right. it falls on me. Right. It's like yep. the same thing of like the, the why, you know, I tell my wife this all the time. Right. Cause you know, it's in modern day society. It's super cool for like, um, women to lead the household or some crazy crap like that. Right. And I'm like, babe, we're equals and we're both in this relationship together. But at the end of the day, like I'm the leader, you know why? Because if you mess up, guess who has to deal with it? I do. Right. If someone, like, if something goes wrong, you don't, you're not the one that deals with it. I am. Right. And like, that's my job. That's why, you know, I, you know, and I tell her. And all, that's not from a cleaning up after somebody no, who's less competent than no. your standpoint. It's from a, that's what I've committed to you, that I'll be the one that does that. And I want you to do things in a different realm, yeah, right? And, uh, in a silly way, this is why, I, I don't know, we, we made it in our relationship that when we're both in the car, I drive. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And it was a similar conversation yeah. of like, I want to know that I did everything possible to, to be the protector of my family in whatever situation yep. came our way. So I'm going to take, that, that the, 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 the physical manifestation of that is me driving the car. Now, not everybody has to do this right. out of requirement. That's the way it is for us. Right. So I, I get that. hundred percent. And it's just like, you know, if I make a mistake, I got to clean it up. But like at the end of the day, like I, like I'm the one, right. I'm the dude. And like in entrepreneurship, I'm like, I'm the dude. So maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe let me say it this way. I think he who casts the biggest vision is essentially the number one. And and should operate that way. And maybe maybe that's why I just reserve it for I haven't yet in, I haven't yet met anybody who's cast a bigger vision for me and and my purpose than I have. And so I've always been. That's an fair. That's fair. Yeah, I can't imagine you work for somebody else, dude. That's I can't. I can't. I guess I can't either. And but I'm trying to go to the. Oh man, are there, is there any possible way this equation gets solved differently? So I, I think it, my gut to it would be, yeah, I'm the same. I. All right. I wouldn't trust anyone else with the 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 non discre like the discretionary time thinking around moving this forward that besides me. Yeah. I think that's accurate. Yeah, that's that's fair. Yeah. Okay. So you get entrepreneurs, you're an entrepreneur. <sighs> what are you building? Like or not what are you building? What like what's what's sovereign entrepreneur? What what's the problem you're solving? Wh when should entrepreneurs come to you? That yeah. So, so the circle back up to that, like where our company, where the company is now versus where it will be, that answer will differ. Yeah, right? sure. I want it to be where the third grader eating crayons in the back of the room, who is the entrepreneur. That's why he's not fitting into the norm of what's in the room. Right. 
I want that person to, to, to be, to have a path to be able to come to me. I don't have a company that's doing that right now. Yeah. So, oh, to Brad, work- it's like you're answering the question finally of what the vision of this is, man. It's like, I ask you one question and you like want to teach on it. And then I ask you a different one. You answer oh. the first one. I'm like, ah, okay. There's some vision right there. Okay. Okay. That makes sense to me. Yeah. I want, I want anybody who's entrepreneur. Cause again, what's the point of wealth? It's to support the path of entrepreneurship, to make that less risky and more powerful and to, to have more impact. Mm. So whether you're in third grade or whether you're Colonel Sanders with KFC and you're starting your first business at the age of 60, it doesn't matter. Wealth is the backstop to the entrepreneur. All right. So sovereign entrepreneurs is the path for any entrepreneur to create wealth, right? Yeah. And, ha- and the be able to come. The path that they should follow. You can, you can create wealth lots of different ways, Fair. but if you're entrepreneurial minded, there's a path you are best suited to follow. That is fully customizable to you, obviously, but from a principal perspective, right? So, yes. so that, the, the wealth piece. And what does that look like right now? Um, for those people that might be interested, they're like, okay, our poor, the poor listeners here, like I'm trying to answer yeah. the question of what you do for like 45 <laughs> minutes, right? But this is just how it goes, right? So, but, like, but like me, Brad, I, I know what on, or Sovereign Entrepreneur does kind of. Like I know what it, do, it, it does because you and I have had a million conversations about it. Right. And I've yeah. got to see behind the scenes, but like, I don't actually know what your offering is and like all that, like specifically speaking, what problem do you come in and solve now? And, and yeah. So this tell is me, the one I think by I'm... the way, don't sell anybody. Don't teach yeah. me why you did it. Like, or don't teach me what you did. Like, just tell me, help me. Josh, understand. this is what I'm, this is honestly what I'm most excited about. And since leaving, like most of our conversations, um, you know, behind the scenes and dude, I'll give you kudos over and you're not asking for it, but I'm gonna give it to you over and over and over. Like I, because of the business partnership, I had some limitations just emotionally of what I could like confidant in. Like you were the person that was there and available to, for me to like have confidant and like pull this stuff apart. So it was invaluable. But the thing that came, there was a piece missing when we left feeling really good about what Sovereign Entrepreneur was, what it was gonna stand for, where it was gonna go, that I then had to spend like three or four months uh, working to apply this to to figure out. And you're talking about like, we did the two events together at your place. We did right? the two events together. We, we, we linked all the concepts together. Like I essentially rewrote, took, went back to first order wealth principles, yeah. started over from a thought process and said, if it, if I only talked to entrepreneurs and business owners, what would it look like? What yeah. would the conversation have to look like? And you getting me through that and helping with like, spur me to do an event and, and put people in the room and, I begged and think you through this. I begged stuff, you. It was like I literally had to beg you every day for a week and I was finally like, we're going to do it. And then it happened. I was like, let's go. Oh my gosh. It was so much fun. That was amazing. And we left. And like I said, and, wouldn't be here with that. And, you, and I think I like how you put it. Like we left there that second event and you were like, okay, I've got this thing here. I see it now. It's almost like you had, you had the idea and you had the pieces or whatever, but there was this piece missing, right? Like to actually turn it yeah. into a business. Yes. Is that, is that what you're saying? Okay, yeah. cool. And, and it wasn't even to turn it into a business, but to be able to really complete the statement okay. of uh, something that I had to discover that was unique to, to business owners and entrepreneurs that had not yet, it's not even in the realm of wealth. It's yeah. a completely independent principle yeah. that I had to grab and bring in, okay. in order to, to make this work. Okay. And the, 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 the principle is all over. We see it in a lot of different ways. Probably the most popular version of this right now is, is who, not how. Right. And, but as I, as I would meet with business, it, more focused in the in the three months during while I figured this out. But even looking back with all entrepreneurs I'd ever interacted with, I'd get frustrated because Josh, I'd teach you, be like, this is how taxes work. This Ugh. is what you need to do. Here are all the things. And just why and then I hoped you would hire me, right? To to be able to put this stuff into place. And then when somebody didn't, I'd get I'd be like so confused. There's like, well I uh, now you know all of this stuff. Why would you have to work of hiring somebody else? But what I found is I tracked people that didn't end up moving forward. It wasn't that they went with somebody else. It's that they didn't do anything at all. Mm. And that frustrated me because mm. I would have rather you gone to somebody else yeah, that makes and sense. at least got something, but you did nothing at all. Okay. And what I realized is when I thought I was handing you the solution, I was handing you another problem. So I would package this all mm. and put it all oh, together. Oh, you were making say, hey. people problem aware all of a sudden. And yes. Mm. So now they have the problem. Okay. But they, they were unwilling to, to 
grab the solution from me because they were incapable of doing it. They didn't either have the time or capability to be able to do it. So I was essentially, Ooh, without realizing that, it, I was giving you a part-time job. Yeah, but I don't, like, because your battle was up against the education or the financial system, right? Like, you're basically, your education was just as much, if not more, explaining why the current version of things was wrong and structurally. And then we got done listening to you and we were like, holy freaking crap, dude. Okay, I get it. But it's almost like you actually didn't even provide a solution in most of the education. You literally just, yeah. you just made us aware of the problem. And like, some yep. of us are like, oh my gosh, I got to get rid of that problem. And so we hired you. But like most people are like, I have a problem, but there wasn't yep. actually a solution. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But as I then would get into the solution and be like, okay, we're going to do this with your tax. We're going to pull this person. In. We do all these things. Again, I started to realize the solution I was trying to hand over was a part-time job mm. for you to manage and run all of this. And it's a job you're not equipped to do and you don't have time to do. And so you just chose to do nothing and retreat back into income. Uh, yep. And so That's then I, fair. I looked at that and said, I have to solve the problem to where this can be done without me handing it back to the entrepreneur. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Now the problem with and, that. And though, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. And just yeah, to clarify yeah. this, meaning you basically came in and by the way, the, the thing that I hope, and maybe this is helpful, maybe it's not, but the thing that attracted me to you more than anyone else or even just in general, I mean, two things. One was you were consistent with your principles, and no matter how hard I pushed, you always had an answer that always aligned. They never, right? But like, secondly, I think much bigger because you know people make emotional decisions. Is you were the only wealth person that I had talked to that was like that was focused on my personal wealth, not profit of the business, right? And I was yes. like, yeah, because who cares about business money, right? Like that's our whole thing. Like get paid. I'm like, I don't care how much. I don't care how much revenue you did. Everyone's like, yeah, profit. I'm like, no, actually, quite frankly, I don't even care how much profit you had. Like I was like, how much money went into your personal bank account? Like that's all I care about, yeah. right? So, and I think what you've done, correct me if I'm wrong, is what you're saying is is like you have gone, you've made the solution, or you've made this problem aware where you educate the entrepreneur on the fact that not only is the financial system broken, but they're thinking about business profit wrong and how wealth and business interact wrong. All these different uh -huh. things. You're not coming in as a business coach. You're literally coming in as this wealth coach slash you know educator person that like makes them aware. And so when you say you have to be able to do it without handing it back to the entrepreneur, you're not talking about in the business, you're talking about in their personal wealth. In their personal okay, wealth. Okay, got it. Okay, yes. continue. So that's that's it. That's that's a massive key distinction. Yep. I just thought of a story I'll tell them, maybe we'll make this. Yeah, like, yeah. So I, I, I grew up on a farm, so very entrepreneurial environment, yeah. right? Small family farm. And, you know, my dad, you know, you learn, I don't know, what's, what's the old quote of like, the older I got, the smarter my dad got or whatever, yeah, yeah. right? I can't believe how much he didn't know with this and when I just, how much he'd learned, whatever that funny quote is, right? And like I, as a teenager, I started to see that as I interacted with my dad more and more, I, I saw what, what he held on his shoulders. Now, if you want to go to Atlas Shrugged, like you yeah. and I both love that concept, but I could, I could see it in my dad of he held up the entire farm and he was giving pieces to us. And so one time I asked him, I was like, dad, what's your, what, what job do you, do you hate the most on the farm? Like what, cause in, in amongst the siblings, um, there was a pecking order as to who got to do what jobs. And the worst job was done by the one lowest on the pecking order. And as I got older, I got to do jobs that I considered to be more fun and enjoyable. I remember asking my dad, what, like, what job do you hate doing the most? And he said, you know, all I want, I actually enjoy every single aspect of it. He's like, but what makes them unenjoyable is when I'm sitting doing one thing, knowing 10 other things are going undone. Mm. Yeah. He's like, that's yeah. the unenjoyable part. Frick, yeah, that's good. That good, right? Yeah. And I now interpret that as the, the, the burden of the entrepreneur that I can't put down is that discretionary thinking, decision-making at the highest level. Mm. That's what I've now realized I've signed up for forevermore, right? And in, as I looked at wealth, that was the part. If I didn't solve that, there's not enough space in an entrepreneur's world yeah. to hold yeah. the part of their business that they can't ever put down and pick up the equivalent of that 
in wealth. Yep. Because in wealth, I have the same thing going on. Yeah. I have 20 people that I need to make sure are all on the same page, all doing the same thing, all leading to the vision that I have and that I've created. And that then all of the ancillary factors of inflation and money printing and, and regulation and other, all of that has to then fit in. And I think I was trying to hand that to them, even though I could bring in and solve a lot of the tactical parts I was hand, because I had completely disrupted their worldview of what they trusted because they trusted Wall Street to be like, oh, all I have to do is do that. And that discretionary part is taken care of. Or all I have to do is buy real estate or all I have to do is this thing. And I showed them that's not accurate. And I was trying to hand them another atlas to hold and they were unwilling to pick it up. Bro, that's the story you lead with. That's the one. Because like that made so that made so much sense, not only in my brain, but as soon as you said that, I'm like, that's why I came that like that's why I ended up on Bitcoin. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of things yep. with it. But like at the end of the day, I'm like, here's my here's my financial strategy, right? Buy Bitcoin. Hold forever. Sure. That's it. And people are like, What do you what do you do with it? I'm like, you just hold it forever. And they're like, When are you gonna sell it? Like, never. Like that, like that's, that's my plan. And because of that, like once I came to that, cause I explored crypto in a million different ways. Right. And yep. like, I love crypto yep. from a technology standpoint, all the different things, but like from a, you, when you explained to me the difference between like investments and businesses and how biz, real estate could be a business or it could be an investment or whatever. Right. And I was like, Oh, my wealth plan is this. I don't understand the debt game. I kind of do. And I get it conceptually, but I'm like too many things. Right. I'm like, yep. buy Bitcoin, hold forever. Cool. Like, that's just what we do. And it just, money just goes in and as we hold it. And I don't care if it goes up. I don't care if it goes down. I don't care if it crashes by 80%. We just buy it and we hold it forever, right? And because of that, I had capacity to go work on a business. And like, that's the problem that you're solving right there, which was like, that's, that's your opening story. Good, right? Yeah. Now, okay. you're also very thrilled that I, you know, boondoggled you into buying a whole life insurance I'm policy very and overfunding I'm it very greatly, thrilled. right? So that's where I come back and say, okay, if Josh is this I, way, but with if Bitcoin, I could only pick one, I would pick Bitcoin. Just FYI, uh, that's uh, fine. Again, but yeah, that's yeah. fine. And I'm just gonna, I'm, dude, I'm making shirts that say both and, right? Like yeah. we live in a world of both and. That's great. So the other part of it is you needed somebody thinking to say, okay, I know Josh is inkling. He'll he'll never be a business owner. Like as I answered the questions you came to me with, this is this is a really good insight. You came and asked essentially, Brad, what should I do? Essentially, and without telling you. I already processed, okay, I know that Josh is an entrepreneur, not a business owner, because we've had all those yeah. conversations. And remember, I talked about this to say, hey, you're not going to actually ever start a business, correct? And you said, yes, that's the way this is going to go. We worked through that entire problem. And I pressed you into Bitcoin. And at two in the morning on my couch, I blew your mind around a couple of other things. But I got enough understanding and knew that no matter what I said, Bitcoin was going to be a buy and hold forever. Yeah. So then I came in and said, all right, here are the other elements that if you don't think about, you're going to be sad and it's going to affect you. So let's put those pieces in place to then support you in the way you've chosen to be an entrepreneur and the way you've chosen to have this other asset. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Can you wrap that up. That okay, it. good. Okay. So, because if we don't finish this thought, people are going to be like, what the frick? When you yeah. say solve the problem of that, like when you're saying like solving this problem yeah. for entrepreneurs, you would give them all this information and then you're like, crap, I have to have a way to solve it finish that thought before we go on to this tangent of crypto or anything like that. Like what yeah. in sovereign well, entrepreneurs, there's the education piece, you make more of a problem. They wouldn't go do anything with it. And you're like, crap, I actually have to solve the problem. I have to make it to where I could take it away from them and do it for them. What does that look like specifically? What's the solution? Yeah. So it, the example of it was what I just said. What I did for you yep. is I understood those elements and said, okay, here's, I will take the Atlas from you and hold it and ensure that all the other places are looked at and, and put into place. So the way we've put this together, this is what we now call chief wealth officer is what I came up with is mm. what is what really solves this. And so after thinking about my dad's, you know, thing now going back to me growing a business, I would use this similar analogy of I'm not a marketer. Like I enjoy the marketing conversation. I can actually understand the high. I actually have more fun in the higher level principles of marketing than I do in the strategies. Yeah, you and suck at marketing. But like I suck at doing yeah, it. Yeah. I, I'm good at thinking about yeah, it yeah. and I can but I suck at the, at the strategy yeah. and tactics levels. So I need somebody to come in and take the strategy and tactics and implement. Because I, we got stuck in our business where I was trying to be that yeah. person and talk to copywriters and funnel builders and Problem. media buyers and all that kind of stuff. So what was the solution? Well, the solution, somebody came and hit me upside the head and said, Brad, you're doing it wrong. 
You need to find somebody who understands the principles, who aligns with, can see the vision of what you're, you're, you're trying to build from a business standpoint. And they come in and they are what's called a chief marketing officer. And mm. it's their job to pull the vision from you to say, this is what my business is going to be. And this is how it's going to work. And these are the, the trade-offs that we've chosen to make. I need somebody to then develop a marketing strategy, yeah. hire and find the people to place into it yeah. and run and manage that so that I get to stay focused where I'm at. That was the only thing that allowed scale. And if you don't find those people in your business, you will always cap out at a certain yeah. level. Now, Josh, wouldn't it be amazing if, you, if somebody could do that inside the world of wealth? And we've all tried it. Like, this is like once I started this conversation, people were like, oh, why? Financial advisor, accountant, uh, family office, uh, money manager. Yeah. Yeah. And none of those end up being the right answer, right? Your accountant isn't that because he's worried about the accounting. He's worried about the business primarily. And even if they are, you're, they're worried about the tax side of it. Yeah, but I think that the reason none of them are the answer to it is not because of what they do, but rather because they don't. I feel like none of them, they all optimize for their thing rather than, a, rather than personal wealth as a whole factoring in the business. Oh, is that it? It, they are a level, that's like taking a copywriter and say, be my CMO. They don't see enough of the entire equation. So your accountant typically doesn't see the decisions you're making inside of your business. And they don't know what your end game of wealth is designed to be. So they can't, they can only give advice from their angle. Same with your attorney. And then any investment advisor, same, your investment advisor doesn't know what's going on in your business, doesn't know what's going on in your personal life, doesn't know how to match all of those types of things. So there has to be a higher level than that, that sees all of that, that works with you to say, Josh, what is your vision? What do you want? What are you willing to compromise on? What are you not? What does success look like? What is your time frame? How is this all going to work? And my job is to convince you to change your mind and follow my principles. Mine is to say, I know what I know about Josh. And one of them is he's an entrepreneur and he'll never not be that. And now with you specific, that will be different for other people is he's long Bitcoin. Okay, cool. How do then the rest of the principles of wealth have to apply to Josh so that he can be successful with those non-negotiables? And then we need to go in and figure okay. out what accountant he needs to use and what his bookkeeper needs to understand and what other investments and how to put the rest of this stuff together without disrupting, without handing that atlas to Josh. I'll go find all of those and I'll go make sure the system is there to, to support. Them. Okay, so you, wow. Okay, so you took, you took the principles of wealth that an entrepreneur would need to apply. And you said, okay, any other money person is going to look at you individually of like personal wealth here and this, but they're not going to look at like, how does the business and your personal beliefs and like your long-term game and like whatever, how does that all fit into your wealth plan? So you basically said, Hey, just like you have a chief marketing officer for your business, right? Or a chief financial officer for your business, right? You're saying, yep. Hey, we're going to create a role, a, a role first. We'll find the person later, but we're going to create a role yep. where the sole role of this thing that, that this position is to to make you wealthy mm, that's okay it. okay wow okay so the, its sole objective is to make you wealthy that's its objective and it does not factor in personal money or only or only accounting or only tax it looks at it and goes okay wait a second you've got this business over here and you've got these assets over here and you have these beliefs of where you want to go here and you have this and so it it's taking your principle or my beliefs and interests and and life as a whole and aligning a wealth plan based in the wealth principles that would allow for that to be achieved. Yes. Dang. On the wealth side as an individual. <laughs> okay. Dang, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You need that's story you into need. that right there, dude. That's it. Right. Yeah. Story right into that. And whew. okay. Because that ultimately is what the business owner, and here's the thing like, Josh, could you get good enough at wealth to create enough of it to change your life? Yes, you, you, oh, you absolutely so boring, can. Though. And at what cost, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I look at it, if there's ever a trade-off, like making money is literally a superpower. And people have heard me teach this and I talk about, but like it is an actual superpower. The way that you make money 
is a superpower. And if I try to take you and take that superpower and apply it to real estate, it, you're going to do it that less well than driving it more you know, forward in your yeah. business. So if I have to compromise, I'm going to compromise on what I can squeeze out of a rate of return in wealth. And I'll position you to make up for it orders of magnitude more by staying in your business. That's why I'm saying wealth is going to support you as the business owner. This seems like a relatively, maybe complex isn't the right word, but it seems like this is not an easy problem to solve. Like if you're having to build the role, and well, I mean, you've thought through it a million different ways. So I, mean, I understand why you'd be the person to do it. But like, this seems like a relative, this is not like not something that just like, oh yeah, I'm going to go hire a chief wealth officer. Like it's, it nope. seems like, it seems like there would have to be First and foremost, there would have to be a guiding set of principles for wealth first. Then there would have to be the person that understand, like you have to understand both the entrepreneur and you have to understand the wealth principles and you'd have to have someone that is able to apply them to both, right? It almost seems like you need somebody who studied yeah. wealth first. <laughs> Then yeah. went to Wall Street and saw its applied, then was a W-2 employee and saw the differences there, and then spent five years trying to get W-2 people wealthy. Like, it, that's exactly it. This was discovered, and this is why there is no such thing as chief wealth officers, why it didn't already exist, mm. and why we had to create it now. Okay, have we missed anything on this? Because I have one more question on this, on, on that wealth piece. No, that's like, if, if you ask me for like my, uh, let, let's go Russell Brunson marketing, right? The new opportunity isn't real estate or wealth or taxes. Like what's the, the answer to what should I do, Brad, to get wealthy isn't any tactic. If anybody brings you and says, well, I did real estate syndications or I even, I did Bitcoin or I did life insurance or I, that's it. They're, they're solving fundamentally the wrong problem mm. for the entrepreneur. The answer to how do I get wealthy is I find a chief wealth officer. Because none of those things are right or wrong. Right. They are just potentially right or wrong for you. Mm -hmm. mm. And so you need a plan. Okay. Wow. We need a strategy. I used to say I do wealth strategy. And I, everyone's mm. like, yeah, hey, I think I know yeah. what that means, right? It's very different though. That makes sense. But it is true. That's what has to be in there first. Yeah. So that's why the exact steps you're going to take are going to look very different than somebody with a different business and a different life and a different, uh, that's why to you, I was like, Josh, for you specifically, that's a great path. And here's all the things we're going to put in place to make sure that you're best supported in that path. So with, um, when you've talked, cause man, this is like, I mean, not just a couple of years, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years in the making. I feel like, I feel like you've been trying to figure this out and put it all, put all, yep. put all the pieces together for a long time. Now that you have this, You've taken to the marketplace, like you've, you've taught, like you've shared this with entrepreneurs, right? You have clients now and yeah. all, all that. You've yeah. done pretty well, which is awesome. Um, what have the objections been? Whew. So some of the objections are, um, I'm not ready. I don't have enough money, right? And there's still this misconception of, I have to get wealth before I can learn to get wealth. Yeah, but, but, right? but. but. That, that's one of the biggest, that, that's, well, anyway, that, that's one of the biggest ones I currently run. Okay, into. let's pretend it's not that though. Cause that's, I feel, I okay. feel like that's more of a, they just have to realize that they are, right? Or maybe they aren't, yeah. right? If, a, if they're broke, maybe it isn't. Cause it, would it be a true statement that some people aren't ready? Yes or no? Okay, yes. cool. So some, so that could be a true statement. Well, let, let me, let me, let me qualify that, okay. right? There will be a point in time where I can say to everybody definitively, no, there's not a time to not do business with me, but. There is a time where executing at where I'm, my business is currently helping people execute is too early stage and you should be doing something different, right? It's never too early to adopt the mentality okay, and understand fair. the principles of wealth for an entrepreneur, right? But I'm not, you're right. There's some people I'm like, just don't do all this stuff wrong and then wait until you're to this point in your business and then we can start helping you. Yes. Okay, so that is a legitimate objection then because long-term that would yes. be like, it's like, oh, I don't have enough. It's like, no, you can start with wherever, right? Yes. What else? Like, is there... Are there been objections to like what, what's pe people's response been to the concept of having an actual wealth officer? Some of it is the objection of, well, I can't trust somebody that level. Mm. I can't turn over those types of decisions. And that's, that's valid and that's tough. And, but it's the same conversation I have. If you can't figure that out in your business, then your business is capped as well. So if you're choosing yeah. to just be capped, then just understand that that's the cap you're accepting. But if you want to go beyond that, 
there's going to be a point in time where it's necessary. But there has not been, have you run into any prints or objections that have like questioned the principle of it where they're like, no, I don't think that's the right route. Wow. That's good. I mean, that, that shows you got to really. have, a, you have a real problem and a real solution. Yep. Okay. Congratulations, by the way, this is fa fantastic. Like fa fascinating. This is really good. Um, and I think that anyone, and it's fun to have it on this podcast with the frames that you put around this podcast, because we get to go into th these parts of it. That's not just like the, you know, perfect webinar yeah, sales it, pitch part of it to be like, it was six months of, I don't know if people, I wonder in my, in, in my lonely moments when I'm sitting around doing this, like, so there are times I wonder if anyone has actually done any real amount of thinking in their like entire life. Yeah. And the last six months has been some of the most difficult thinking I've ever had to do. Mm. And it's been lots of thinking at the expense of making money, yep. which is why I think a lot of business owners haven't done as much yep. thinking as they probably yep. should. I've done nothing but think about this. Blows my mind. For six straight months. It blows my mind, by the way. Like to me, like I, I was telling my friend this the other day, actually I was telling someone I didn't circle this. I was like, I struggle with empathy. And mm -hmm. part of the reason I struggle with empathy is because so many of the problems that people face, I'm like, well, that, duh, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like some of the things I'm just like, they're like, well, Josh, you figured it out. I was like, yeah, but it, you didn't have to convince me it was a problem, right? Like you didn't have to convince me that it was something that I had, like people are like, oh, I can't do this or I can't, I'm like, so figure it out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like think about it. And, uh, I think that's one of them is like, people are like, I don't have time to think. I'm like, well, that's a problem, right? Like that's a problem. But I think that's a perfect transition and segue into where I, I want to open this conversation of crypto because okay. we, we're not going to have yeah. the conversation today, but I want to, I want to lay the groundwork. Cause a lot of people, a lot of people want the conversation. I want the conversation. Right. But yeah, let's be honest. I know you say a lot of people want the conversation. I want, want the conversation. conversation. I want the conversation. Although I, so, I do think a lot of people do, but not, nobody's as bad as I do. But but yeah. I, I think it's in similar vein to where you were convincing me, like you needed to sit me down and hear my thoughts on wealth. Now it's reversed. Well, I, I want to go back to the thing where you said where you were in deep thinking, right? I'm like, okay, yeah. yep, yep, yep. you're talking about the conversation of wealth and you're thinking about wealth specifically for an entrepreneur who's typically a little bit more open-minded perhaps anyway, right? I do not think that you can have a serious discussion about wealth in forever moving forward, from this day moving forward. Like, I don't think you can have a serious conversation about wealth and what that looks like without talking about Bitcoin. Like, I don't think it's possible anymore. Like, it's so significant. And the more I study it, I'm like, it is, it is probably, I mean, I think AI probably may have more significance in maybe how our world, maybe to technologically, I, I don't know AI well enough. It, it, I know it's scary and it's powerful, but like you cannot have a conversation about money, wealth, and, and, and the future of that without having a conversation about the digital world, the digital assets, blockchain, and specifically Bitcoin with its finite structure. And so the thing I think that bugged me about, and I'll be honest, like the, the with the, the, about you is like, when I was like, or whatever, a year and a half ago when I was in your you know, living room or whatever. And I was like, if I were to just send you clips on this, how would you like to conceive it? And you're just like, you know, what? actually not at all because I just don't care. Right. And like, like, I think the thing that bugged me is I'm like, but you can't not care. Right. And so you need, like, it has to happen. Right. And so like, it, I, it sounds like, I mean, we've not had this conversation. This is actually the first time, but you know, in our brief text back and forth, it sounds like you're much more open to it now and, and have thought about it much more than the last time we talked. But like, you know, in the next 10 minutes or so, help me just understand where you're at with crypto and Bitcoin and crypto, you, you understand they're different, right? Like, okay, yes. cool. Just making sure. I, I mean, I'm aware that they're different. I couldn't e explain to your satisfaction okay, but, but, why. But conceptually, but like where Bitcoin is its own category yeah. and then there's all the crypto, right? But like, where yeah. are you at with that? And where do you see that playing into the wealth conversation, setting up for a future conversation that we will dive into this? Yes. So on the heels of this one, a couple of reasons why I didn't want to go into it. One is I was solving a different problem. And I feel like the biggest mental lift of solving that, I could not say what it was, but now it's the chief wealth officer to be like, okay, cool. Maybe I have a little brain capacity to start into the crypto. So a lot of it, a lot of it was, I had a problem I knew I was trying to solve that I didn't I get want to okay. devote anything else to. So 
So that that's part okay. of it. The other part of it is in line with this whole conversation is I don't want to debate the tactics of crypto. I don't want you yeah. to say this is the next one that's going to yeah, make yeah. money and all that. And that's been essentially everybody's conversation that's brought it to me is to be like, it's so much better than real estate because I'm <laughs> going to make this amount of yeah. money. I'm like, well, that's not really, that's an opinion. And I can't debate your opinion. Yeah. We can debate facts. Yeah. And that's what I want to get into. I am interested in a conversation pushing to first order principles around crypto. And then going from there and saying, if all of those are true, what then do we need to update about our tactics and strategies? And I'm, I think I'm open to the possibility, but I need a lot more information than I've had, that this really is, you know, very few things change the conversation of wealth, right? I think property rights, right? The ability to Bitcoin. own land Bit would have changed right. it. Yep, yep. And, and, and the reason that is such an apt thing is there wasn't property rights in money before really because government owned it right so this is that's why i think there's some some opportunity to explore right. and be like oh, okay before you you wouldn't you wouldn't talk about owning real estate in the conversation of wealth before you were allowed to own real right. estate so now that we're allowed to i'm so now there there are some interesting things to explore there so as long as it's not that's why i yeah. avoided those conversations to this point and yep. i think you'd be one that could take me to that okay. level. Yes. yes, yes. A couple things to for your own brain so that you, because sh you should know as you're thinking about this and as you're looking at this, you should ignore every other crypto except for Bitcoin right now. Okay. You should only focus on Bitcoin. And the reason I say that is because crypto as a whole, like the only, the, the correlation between Bitcoin and other crypto is that they both use blockchain technology. Okay. That's okay. for the sake of this conversation, the only difference that's like that or i mean the only similarity right like technically there are others but like so when people say crypto they're talking about crypto as in you know coins and blockchain technology and all that digit like it's digital property it's it's you know the the crypto vector signatures and using the blockchain to send back and forth the fact that we can track and verify things all the that's blockchain technology right so okay bitcoin runs on one blockchain all the other cryptos run on a million other different blockchains. Bitcoin is its own blockchain. It is the Bitcoin network. It is proof of work, not mm -hmm. proof of stake. Okay. So when we're having this conversation about money, Bitcoin only, because Bitcoin is money. Actually, Bitcoin, I don't even think it's a currency. Bitcoin is property, right? It's not actually a currency yep. yet. When everyone says like, oh, it's a, it's yep. a currency. I'm like, no, it's actually not. But like, that's not all right. No, no, it's just not, period. Not yet. Okay. It's not, not yet. It's just not, right? Okay. Anyway, but like, so there's that. When you think about crypto though, I believe how crypto will reshape the world is simply a different technology on how we do things that we already do, AKA. So the block right, the block exactly, exactly. Change the world. Well, in, in the concept, not of Bitcoin, right? Because in, in the blockchain tech, you know, thing, like smart contracts, all contracts will be on the blockchain in the future. That doesn't fundamentally change how contracts work, right? People right. won't buy shares of companies. They will buy coins, right? Be and that is what, that, that will be the controlling thing. They will, write, so the coins and the different things are going to be like shares and stock and, you know, things of that nature, right? And so like, we're going to start do, it's like the internet. Like it didn't fundamentally change how we interacted or like, you know, the fact that, you know, the money was exchanged or value was exchanged or like whatever, right? It just like gave us a different mechanism or a different medium to go about doing that, right? Me that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is different. Bitcoin fundamentally changes the way that the world operates does that make sense like from a principle order perspective uh -huh. and okay. like so how i like to explain it to people is think of the rest of crypto as business think of bitcoin as money does that make sense okay just like you talk about there's two fundamentally different things it's like business and money or business and wealth it's like cool bitcoin and all other crypto are two separate categories. completely separate categories and it's like it's very important to understand that right so right. where, and there's a famous saying, you, you got to look up Michael Saylor, right? Like if there's one person I think that you would appreciate and, and that you should go and study, like, like see what he's doing. Like, yes, he's kind of funny at the time, whatever, but he's like the biggest Bitcoin individually, the biggest Bitcoin bear, right? He's the Elon Musk of Bitcoin if, or, or a bull. I mean, he's the Elon Musk of Bitcoin, he's cool. billions and billions of dollars. He's like raising money, creating debt on his company and borrowing all the money and just dumping it into Bitcoin. He's essentially got this money printer where he just borrows money, buys Bitcoin and the value of the company goes up and then he issues more debt and he goes by it's crazy. Anyway. So what I would say to you is I would say, ignore all of crypto. 
only go to understand how Bitcoin changes the game. Because for you, if you want to stay in that lane of wealth, that's the one that you need to understand. Once you understand that one, and once you understand how that functions and operates, then the rest of it is relatively simple. It's like easier from there. Does that make sense? Because okay. you can create more and that, that, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes, yeah. it does. And so you're going to hear some crazy things when you go and do it. And I will set up this conversation more later, you know, later. But I like what you said as far as like you want, you want to explore truth. You want to explore principles, not, oh, is this a better way to make money? No, no, no. Um, but you'll, you'll hear a couple of things. You know, one Bitcoin is, equals one Bitcoin. And the whole concept of that is like people are like, how, how, how much money, like how high will Bitcoin go? It's like, no, no, stop. You're still measuring it in dollars. Stop measuring it in dollars. One Bitcoin equals one. Okay, that is a, that is a massively powerful statement that I can't get anybody else to say because I'm going to be coming at this through a lot of the research I've done into gold and silver. And I've got an entire philosophy on that, but it's the same argument with an ounce of gold. How much is it going to go up to? No, an ounce of gold is an yes. ounce of gold. That's what yes. makes it what it is. And it always will be yes. that and stop measuring it. I don't measure my, the, how much gold I have right. in the dollars nope. that it backs right. right now. I just measure it in the number of ounces of yes. it that I have. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, okay? The other thing that you're gonna hear, which is not gonna make any sense probably until you actually start studying it, is like Bitcoin is energy, Bitcoin is property rights, Bitcoin is history, right? And you're like, what does that even mean, okay? Now, I have to tell you, one night I was with my friend and I'm telling you this because you know me and it's my show, not yours, okay? But we have been studying <laughs> Bitcoin for, and, and crypto for, I mean, we've been doing this for years together. He's one of my best friends and we were out here. And we had been studying for about eight hours one day. And then we smoked some weed and we were pretty high. Not like super, super, but like we were still functioning, but you know, you kind of get that little, I mean, you don't know, but like you get the concept, yeah. right? And we yes. started going down this road. Just high enough to have this right. conversation that you're about right. to talk about. And like, we started looking at it and we're like, Bitcoin is literally all just math. It, it like 100% is. And like Bitcoin is, Satoshi didn't create anything. He just discovered it. And he basically okay. That's aligned mathematical principles. And so when people are like, oh, it can be changed or it can be this or it's not this, it's like, no, no, stop, 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 stop. All he did was turn on math in cyberspace. Like he gave us this portal to where like, hmm. It's math. It's literally just numbers and data, and it cannot be changed ever, right? Like everybody can see every transaction that's ever been done on the blockchain ever with Bitcoin, and it can never be changed forever, but it's all just numbers. And when you hear Bitcoin mining, right? You know what they're doing? They're solving mathematical equations. That's what, math, uh, that's what Bitcoin mining is. They're literally just solving mathematical, super duper, duper, duper complex mathematical equations and getting rewarded for it. When we do a, a transaction or a block, it's all just math. And so when you think about physics and you think about, you know, how all the, you know, all the world is zeros and ones, right? Like, yeah. when you think about it from that perspective, it's like, oh, that's why, like, when I had that conversation and then I like, you know, woke up the next morning and I was like, was that real? Yep. And then I went and like looked and I'm like, oh my gosh, it all is. And there's like whole been books about how Bitcoin is all just math. The reason I think that you will like it and not the rest of crypto is because I think it is, I think Bitcoin is, <clears throat> hear what I'm saying here, not truth as in Jesus, truth. Right. But truth right. as in this is react like this is true. Right. Like fundamentally, this is what true equals. Does that make sense? Yes. And it took just like it took certain advancement in instruments to measure things in the in the physical world. Right. Einstein's or, you know, whoever's been proven wrong right. because now we, we can th see things more that, so the truth was always there. Somebody discovered it because we had the capabilities right. to, to be able to do that. You're making the case that whatever this application happens to be, whether it's money, whether it does fit into to the actual wealth conversation yes. or how society is structured and organized, we now are capable of aligning with yes a principle that has been there independent yes. of any yes. individual or human society. Yes. And now it's going to open doors yes. that just were not yes. previously, you know, levels that were not previously achieved. Yes, Bitcoin. That's an interesting conversation. Like very much so. And that's why I'm saying like, you can't like, bro, you like, you have to understand it. Like you have to, right? Like, because I'm like, Bitcoin wasn't created. It was just discovered. He just happened to. No one's ever told me that before. No one's ever said that before. Or I never heard yeah. that. Go, go study, go look at Michael Saylor. Michael Breedlove has some good, uh, or um, Robert Breed, Breedlove has a podcast called What is Money? And I think that would be interesting for you. You should get on that show, actually. Maybe I, I'll see if I can get you on that show. Anyway, we're going to pick up the conversation. But 
Okay. To end this, because I know you have a hard cutoff here. Um, uh, to end this, I have two two questions. One, what was and maybe you answer this in sixty seconds to two minutes, right? Like, make it quick. Uh, is what op- What finally got you to go? Okay, I'm I'm open to having this crypto convers or this Bitcoin conversation. Uh, really, the the well, it's two two things that I already said. One was just a capacity. I knew what I was stepping into before when you were asking yeah. me about this, and I just said, nope, that I have a more important problem I need to yep. solve. And then two, I didn't have. I need a guide on this because back to calling. This is all very interesting, but I don't get pulled to this in my spare time. So I need somebody that's gone deeper that thinks in principles that can then bring it back and make it digestible. So that's you. So it was those so what, two But what made it now? Like just because you have capacity now? There's no, it's, okay, yeah. all right, that's fair. All right, last question. And this is, we're shifting gears here, but for the sake of time, you'll, we'll, we'll have you back on. Um, last question is, I talk a lot about you. Uh, a lot of my story is based around things that you taught me in on, the entrepreneurship game and you know things of that nature. So the respect is mutual both ways. Um, but there's a lot of people listening that are like, one of the questions I get is like, why did Brad say yes to Josh in the first place? Right? Because like I had you on the podcast. That's where we essentially met, right? We didn't really know each other. We had like maybe one conversation before that, but we didn't know each other. And then we did the podcast. And then shortly after the podcast, you became a client, right? I hired you or you hired me for the, the social media stuff. What, what mm-hmm. made you say yes originally? To the podcast or to hiring Josh? Both. So the, 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 the fate was a Ruth Chris, the fateful yeah, Ruth yeah. Chris interaction, right? Where I'll just recount the story for everybody. I had, I had seen a, a social media version of yeah. Josh. And so I had formed an idea of what it was. I was, I had the ability to sit next to you at a dinner and I was like, ah, I'm going to use this time to prove myself right. That I never have to talk to Josh and I could ignore him evermore. And then, you know, five hours later, they were kicking us out because they were putting the chairs up. So I had already had the depth of conversation with you that I was excited. You had pulled things out of me. This, I think, is just why you're so successful on podcasting and just human connection relationship. You had pulled things out of me that I had struggled to connect the dots in front of everybody because all, it was just you know chaos inside of my head, all those thoughts. So I was excited to do that on the show. So the, the, the yes to the show was, to replicate for others the, the power that came out of you pulling that out of me in, in the conversation. Yes to Josh from a, from a client standpoint is that thinking then you, we were studying the same marketing and business principles. I had struggled to master them. You had, and you could prove that to me by the level of thinking you would, you would put mm. out there. And so it was finally a person that I said, wow, I can unload. I was in that I needed to, to let go of the Atlas to somebody else in some of those areas. And you were somebody that in your realm of genius took that on. And, and remember, I think in some testimonial I gave you, I was like, I gave the field gets yep, wet. I, yeah, I use that one. And yeah. now you were that person. Yeah. And would you say that it would be accurate then that on the podcast, we talked about ideas. We talked about something that allowed there to be a level of conversation, an idea of conversation where trust was created. We aligned on values the, the, and, and the trust and the values were there that ultimately allowed you then to say yes to something, even though it was unrelated technically the value and the trust was created or the values were aligned and the trust was created prior to that that ultimately got you to make the decision that way yeah yep okay cool all right dude thank you so much for your time i really really appreciate it i know you have a hard cut off um where can people find you uh it's in works but sovereignentrepreneur.com i know there's lots of e's and g's and i's in there it's two french words together we'll figure it out but sovereignentrepreneur.com I've got a newsletter there, a show going live soon. And then if you subscribe to the newsletter, we do the normal thing. Like we've got trainings and like you get exposure to all the ideas. Um, And then via all of that, ultimately, because of what this is, you can't do this without sitting down with me and going through this and figuring it out. So whenever that is ready, all of the steps are are there, but just sovereign entrepreneur, it's a simple, just opt in right now. We'll add stuff to it as, as we get going and keep it simple. Sweet. But that's that's where. All right, guys, we'll link it down below. Brad, thank you for your time. As always, we'll do it again soon. Appreciate you. Until next time, guys. Appreciate you, Tom. Uh, Yeah, that's all I got. We'll see you next time. Peace.